The race is on to find alternatives to animal and tropical fats, but which approaches are the most promising? We're definitely very much looking into bakery and baked applications, as well as confectionery applications. And the reasons for that are very easy. Like we're talking about dairy fat replacement, we're talking about cocoa powder replacement, and palm oil, and palm oil replacement. Those three ingredients are core for those industries, but have been facing extreme challenges from a supply chain perspective. They are an extreme toll for the environment, and at the same time, they are amazing ingredients. Their functionality is so hard to replicate, and so this is very much like the opportunity area that we have been working on with a bunch of partners. So you're taking, as far as I understand it, a carbon source and a hydrogen source, kind of heating them up, oxidizing them to create fats, and so these are just chains of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen atoms, is, is that right? Yeah, it is yeah. right. So we have, as a result, this very broad distribution of fatty acids, mm -hmm. and fatty acids are those building blocks of any kind of fats and oil, and so mm -hmm. we build them into uh, triglycerides, mm -hmm. and then with triglycerides, we can create all these different recipes for different applications in the food industry. Mm -hmm. So is this a kind of multi-step process, and is it super energy intensive? You know, what equipment or other inputs are needed to to facilitate your process? So we start from those basic elements. So you talk about carbon, hydrogen, and then we put a very high pressure and heat oxygen into the mix mm -hmm. uh, to create those fatty acids. Mm. Where we do it right now is um, a facility that we bought that used to be an oil processing facility. Uh, and so we are actually able to leverage uh, some core unit operations that are already present in the food system. How would you say compare this on a capex front and on you know, operational costs versus say producing fats through microbial fermentation? Is, is this cheaper? Yeah, well, it's very, very hard to say because yeah. uh, I'm not an expert in fermentation. Yes. Um, what we know happens with some of the biological routes that you just uh, mm. described is that those scales have never been reached before. Yes. And so there is like a huge unknown around how this will look like. On our end, we are talking about a more durist uh, approach, and so we have more granularity into those numbers. So how tunable is the fatty acid profile of the fats that you can make with this process, and, and where in the process does this tuning take place? Totally, yes. Um, tunability is very key in what we do. Um, we create fatty acids, we have this very broad distribution of fatty acids, and you can think of fatty acids as the building blocks of fats and oils. And so at that point you have this library that you can play with uh, to build whatever you want on the other end. So we're definitely very flexible. It comes towards the end of the process. Yes. And it's very important for us, given the design space that is very broad, to have partnerships on the other side with players who really know what they need and what they want, because mm -hmm. this is where the combination is very powerful. Mm -hmm. Right now we are working with point capture CO2, we are working with methane, uh, we take hydrogen from water, we take oxygen from the air, and these are just like some of the examples of what we can do as we scale up. Mm -hmm. But from a sustainability perspective, does this kind of only um, have green credentials if you're using certain sources of these gases, or does it still make sense even if you're not? Everything we are using so far has an incredible potential when it comes to greenhouse gas reduction. So as a company, we are a climate company at core will never use anything that doesn't result in a major cut in, in emissions. And so everything we do right now has also a very strong climate positioning. So how would Savers Fats be labeled and regulated? Yeah, so we have been talking with the FDA for, uh, for some time. Uh, we have a number of options for how we can call this ingredient on the label. And in parallel, we're talking to partners because commercial partners know what consumers want to hear and what the perception and uh, the sensitivity is around naming. And so we are keeping the process going, but in the meantime, we are a self grass mm -hmm. uh, which means that uh, by the current standard of yes. uh, this, this country, we can sell uh, these ingredients, which is what we're going to do in the next month. How have you funded the business so far? And um, you know, what's your scale up plan? The company raised more than $30 million uh, up to date. Uh, the core investors are Synthesis Capital and Breakthrough Energy Venture. Our pilot plant is uh, outside of uh, Chicago in Batavia, Illinois. Um, and the goal is definitely to test the scale up of this process and to push some commercial partnerships forward with the ingredient that comes out of that plant. And so you'll hear more about us uh, in uh, some of the activations and early partnerships that we're going to release this year. Tell me about your initial focus. 
we are starting this year launching a butter, uh, especially for food service and chefs. This butter has been created internally from our team using our first ingredient to market, which is a dairy fat replacement. Uh, the reason why we decided to launch butter for chefs is that butter is every chef's best friend. Everybody loves butter, everybody can relate to butter, and it's just a the perfect vessel for us to just showcase what the approach can do in terms of functionality. You'll, you'll see more in the market around different baked applications, different like laminated dough, uh, confectionery, and everything just like is coming together with the butter itself to just prove the case of what this could really become.